Dozens of jihadis are flooding into Syria. Many are joining extreme Islamist groups. At least 600 Europeans are estimated to have gone there. With growing concern about what they might do when they return to Europe, we've been to Belgium and the Netherlands, two countries which have seen a large number of Al-Qaeda-inspired foreign fighters leave for Syria. Paul Hackett reports. These uh, jihadis are very dangerous. Uh, they are uh, weapon trained, they have uh, war experience. We have to do to really look what they have done but don't consider them all as terrorists. Does Syria's bloody conflict pose a major terrorist threat to Europe? The war-torn country has become the number one destination for jihadists. In Amsterdam, in the Netherlands, leaders in the Muslim community are deeply concerned by the exodus of more than 100 young men to Syria. Well, this is really a huge problem, what's happening now. Youngsters feel a calling to go there. On the one side, I understand this because these youngsters have this feeling of injustice. On the other side, there's this ideological movement that draws these boys there. And the situation in Syria is so complex that we don't know who they get in touch with. So in my opinion, this is a big issue. So concerned are Dutch authorities about the possibility of one of their own citizens returning from Syria and carrying out an attack, they've recently raised the terrorist threat from limited to substantial. Abdul Karim Honing is a convert to Islam. Also called Dennis, at least 20 of his friends have left for Syria to join rebel forces. He insists he doesn't know anyone planning to carry out a terrorist strike in the Netherlands, but he doesn't deny either that it's a possibility blaming Western foreign policy. I cannot say, yeah, well, uh, they will never do something. And I said that because Europe have to understand that they're that they bombing places, they're fighting places. We have to understand that we're not in Europe in a utopia far away from war. We make war so we are war. Experts agree combating the potential risk will require a mixed approach to avoid a repeat of attacks like the London 7-7 bombings. I think you should have a combined approach. On the one hand, the legal measures, but you cannot uh, do without the more soft end preventative uh, measures. And that's uh, including families, including uh, community engagement and a tailor-made individual approach. Do you have the means? Can you cope with hundreds of people who come back and do a 24-7 monitoring or observation? That's impossible. So you have to make, try to make a distinction between the terrorists and those who want to come back and want to live a normal life. Making that distinction between the would-be terrorists and those who don't present a security threat when they return home remains one of the main challenges facing European authorities. Joining me now to discuss this issue is Majid Nawaz, a former Islamist extremist who now works to combat radicalization, and Raffaello Pantucci, a senior research fellow on counterterrorism at the Royal United Service Institute. Gentlemen, many thanks for joining us on the front line. Majid Nawaz, we've had a brief 360 of the situation. It all sounds rather alarmist, doesn't it? Well, I think we have very good reason to be concerned. We do know that the most effective fighting group there in Syria on the ground at the moment is the al-Qaeda-affiliated Jabhat al-Nusra. We also know that those who are inspired by their religion to go over to Syria are highly likely to join some Islamist brigade or the other. And so we should be concerned if they do come back, especially after hearing that young man, uh, when they say things like Europe makes war, so it is war, because that's the sort of rhetoric that could transfer into operations on European soil. But there was a time when people would say that Iraq was the next or the university of terrorism. That didn't really, really materialise. And so, so why is Syria different? Well, there's two reasons why it's different. And on Iraq, actually, it did materialise in the sense that um, the al-Qaeda in Iraq are now, many of them are behind the training for the Syrian al-Qaeda. Uh, they have an alliance. The, the, the other point, though, why it's so, uh, so concerning is that it's the... Uh, even more so than Afghanistan. It's the first time we've had such numbers of Western European born and raised fighters going abroad to join jihadist or what looks like jihadist battalions. And we've never had numbers uh, from Europe uh, that reach uh, these levels uh, before ever in our history. Rafael Pantujan, are we facing some sort of perfect storm then? Um, I think in many ways to describe Syria as a perfect storm in terms of a 
potential terrorist threat coming back to Europe from a jihadist battlefield. I think that's probably a very good way of putting it. Uh, you have a situation here where you have a battlefield which has remained in a sort of stalemate for a long period of time. You have groups that are connected to al-Qaeda. You have groups that espouse a rhetoric similar to that of al-Qaeda, but aren't necessarily connected to an al-Qaeda network. And these groups and the foreign fighters who are drawn to them mean that w there is a direct link between these groups and the areas where they control in Syria and uh, the West and the European Union and certain European countries. And so these fighters provide that sort of connection. And, you know, the levels of brutality, the use of chemical weapons, the sort of international community's inability to come to a decision about what to do, it's becoming a sort of giant focus of attention. Um, and so in many ways, yes, it does look like a sort of perfect storm. So drawing upon your own experiences, What's going on in these young guys' heads, generally young Muslim lads? Why would they want to turn against the countries they were born and raised in? Well, it begins with a comprehensive identity shift. And when that happens, as Muhammad Sadiq Khan in the video that you showed stated in his speech before the 7-7 attacks in London, he said in a thick Yorkshire a accent, having been born and raised there, he said, your people have attacked my people. And he was referring to Iraq, a country he'd never visited. And so that's what happens is that the identity shifts to such an extent that people no longer feel any sense of affinity to the country that they are born and raised in, and they feel more of a sense of belonging to people in third countries they've never visited because of the ideological bond they're sharing, and that's enough to motivate them to travel. And, you know, the 7-7 bombers in London, how inspirational are they now to young guys out there in Syria? Well, of course, uh, we, again, to be careful, not everyone in Syria who's travelled mm. will be with al-Qaeda, but we, I, I'm very worried. Uh, and the reason I'm, and I'd be surprised if there wasn't a, an attack, because we have up to a, a roughly 800 foreign fighters from Europe, 200 of those from Britain. And now somebody may think, why would they possibly attack Britain when it's Assad who's their enemy? Well, you know, let's look back to Boston and see that there was a Chechen who you would have thought would have defined Russia as his enemy, but still managed to define America as the enemy and attack in Boston. Once you adopt an ideological view and look at the world through that lens, as your, uh, uh, the young Muslim in your video said, um, it, it, it becomes an issue of Muslim versus non-Muslim. So it doesn't matter who you're attacking, really, as long as it has some strategic advantage to your cause. Let's not forget that terrorism is all about the display and the show and the theater. Syria is in chaos. It's pretty easy to get in and out of the country. What's the risk of chemical weapons getting into the wrong hands? Um, I think on the battlefield, it's possible that it might happen. Mm. Uh, if we're worried about these going beyond Syrian borders, there are a set of technical issues that will, of course, complicate matters. Uh, the sort of ones that people are particularly worried about, sarin or something else, I mean, they require special ways of transportation. And so it's difficult to see necessarily the groups would have the capacity to do that. OK. Um, we've been looking at the threats. Now let's look at how some people are saying we should respond to mm. this. Philippe de Winter is a Belgian politician from the Flemish nationalist party Vlaams Belong. He recently visited Syria at the invitation of the country's government. He says the foreign fighters going there should be barred from returning to Europe. For the rest it's quite dangerous. When they come back to our countries, these will be the future terrorists uh, who will fight their jihad also over here. So uh, I think uh, we should do everything to keep them over there. Don't let them come back, take away, we have to take away their uh, citizenship, their Belgian or European citizenship, we have to take away their social security allowances, take everything away that facilitates them to come back to our country. Majin uh, briefly again, um, that's one response, isn't it? It's a knee-jerk reaction. Um, it will only send these people underground and will give them every incentive uh, to attack. Uh, after that stage because you leave them with no option, you back them into a corner. I think we need to have a more subtle approach. It's, uh, it's not the case of taking a, a sledgehammer to crack a nut. Raffaele Pantucci, uh, we, the Radicalisation Awareness Network, which we saw on the report, um, mentioned legal challenges. Mm. Um, what legal recourse is there? Because going into Syria, leaving Syria, uh, isn't illegal. You're right, it's very difficult to sort of uh, create a legal framework to convict these people. You know, the passports, taking away the passports. I mean, it's, it's a difficult one to do. But I mean, then there's a practical reason of what actual impact does it have? <laughs> you know, take away the guy's passport. Um, if he's a really determined person, he'll have a network that he can get himself a fake one and he can sneak back in that way. Um, so what's actually been the net result? Well, then finally, and this is a question to both of you then, if, if we're going to do a massive rewind and we want to stop 
this radicalisation at source stop young kids wanting to turn against uh, their countries in Europe? How do you do that? Well, I was radicalised initially at the age of 16 because of our inaction and inability to do anything in Bosnia. And, you know, us standing by and watching a genocide in Srebrenica unfold uh, led to me feeling like, well, the world doesn't care. And I believed that with Libya, with Kosovo, we learnt those lessons and we intervened in a way that was sensible, not the uh, bluff and blunder that happened with Iraq and the invasion. So I think that, of course, there are lessons to be learnt and our inaction in this instance could just be the very thing that lets Al-Qaeda to continue growing because, I, I, again, I believe that we missed the boat. Up until now, I think the reasons why Jabhat al-Nusra and al-Qaeda have continued to grow and become the most effective fighting force on the ground, it can be argued, is that we were too late in acting. And so I think, again, we need to learn the lessons from that. Um, I think people who become drawn to these ideas aren't drawn to them solely because of the sort of foreign policy vision that they see being espoused. No, I think it's a personal feeling of something not happening in their lives, some sense that there's some uh, movement that they should be part of, some sense of something missing, some sense of personal aggrievement that also plays into it. And so I think it's a very complicated picture. I think the other lesson of the past uh, decade, if not longer, two decades maybe, is that it's very difficult for governments to figure out how exactly to crack that code and how exactly to develop policies that will specifically persuade young men mostly of a certain age um, that uh, pursuing these sorts of ideas and this sorts of violence is not the right path. Gentlemen, many thanks for having joined us on the front line. Last year, there were more than 200 terrorist attacks in Europe. Could that number rise dramatically given what's happening in Syria? You can contact us on social media to tell us what you think. In the meantime, On the Frontline returns next month. <laughs>